And welcome to the second lecture of the 2012-13 Omnibus Lecture Season. After meeting Mia Farrow in September, I am increasingly excited about our upcoming lectures and the experience of interacting with distinguished leaders on topics of national and international interest. I was very fortunate to have had the opportunity to meet Jeffrey Tubin earlier this evening, and I share your enthusiasm about his timely and fascinating topic, Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court. All things politic are so much at the forefront of our thoughts and interactions right now, and a significant aspect of our current discourse, privately and publicly. But first, I'd like to take just a few minutes to make a few comments about our university. I continue to be so impressed by the incredible momentum of IPFW and this community. Since 1964, moving forward truly has defined our campus. We are now Indiana's fifth largest university and the only comprehensive university in Northeast Indiana. We offer more than 200 internationally recognized IU and Purdue degrees and certificates. Our academics focus on students and connect them to the world with education that prepares them for careers and takes them well beyond the classroom through our partnerships in the community, in the region, and truly around the globe. These omnibus lectures, now in their 18th year, serve as an excellent example of our campus and our community moving forward together. Let me thank the sponsors of the Omnibus Lecture Series. I'd like to recognize the founding sponsor of Omnibus, the English Bonter Mitchell Foundation, which has funded the series since 1995 and through their generosity has enabled all of these lectures to be offered free of charge. With the foundation's support, IPFW has been able to host more than 100 nationally recognized speakers who have enriched the educational experience of our students and engaged our community. Many thanks also to the 2012-13 Omnibus Media sponsors, Wayne TV and Northeast Indiana Public Radio, who have supported the series for many years, helping us to, a public, to publicize these outstanding lectures. Now let me tell you just a little bit about the format for this evening. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. There is one microphone stand on the lower level and one on the second level. Please line up behind the microphones to ask your question rather than shout it from your seat so we all can hear. Please keep your question short so that we can accommodate as many people as possible during the limited time we have available for questions. Mr. Tubin's books will be for sale in the lobby and there will be a book signing with him immediately following the lecture. And now I am pleased to introduce Georgia Ralstad Umschneider, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Professor Umschneider is an IPFW Associate Professor of Political Science and pre-law advisor. She has had a distinguished career here as a professor since 1987, teaching classes such as judicial politics, civil liberties, and constitutional law. Georgia's areas of research include political trials and the First Amendment. She is also a recipient of the prestigious IPFW Community Advisory Council Service to Students Award. Please welcome Professor Ulm Schneider. Good evening, everyone. Prominently displayed on Time Magazine's cover exactly five years ago today was the following question. Does the Supreme Court still matter? Implicit in the question are the following ideas. One, that the court's central role in American civic life has dwindled. Two, that its justices no longer sit at the intersection of law and politics. And three, that the cases the justices consider 
are no longer the stuff of monumental decisions. Jeffrey Tubin's reporting suggests otherwise. It suggests, to paraphrase Mark Twain, that the Supreme Court's demise has been greatly exaggerated. Tubin's work on the court focuses our attention on the vexing nature of the issues the court has faced recently or soon will. Terrorism, money in politics, abortion, affirmative action, health care. Issues that raise fundamental questions about the nature of rights, the role of the states in our American political system, and of course the meaning of equality. Equally important, Tubin's work, notably his latest book, The Oath, The Obama White House and the Supreme Court, reminds us that while the Supreme Court is a legal institution bound by tradition and rules, it is also a human institution, that its decisions are influenced, just as legislative and executive ones are, by personal interactions, temperaments, experiences, and values. Jeffrey Tubin's reporting has been informed not only by his impeccable legal background, but also by his remarkable access to those he reports about, the justices. Please join me in welcoming to IPFW the award-winning journalist and best-selling author, CNN's senior legal analyst, Jeffrey Tubin. Thank you, Georgia. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So glad to be here. Okay, so six months ago, approximately, when this, when this lecture was booked, I said to myself, October 24th, 2012, I want to be in the center of the political universe. <laughs> and I am. How great is that? Every national story, it's all about Indiana today. But, 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 but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. We'll have something to say about uh, the Senate contest here. But first, hello. Anyway, it's great to be back in Fort Wayne. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be part of this uh, really distinguished uh, lecture series in this beautiful setting on this beautiful university. And um, so I, I'm going to talk uh, about the Supreme Court tonight. And we're going to do questions later. And, um, but first, I'd like to perhaps anticipate a question that you may have. And that's, who's your favorite justice? Um, now, this is a little bit of a tough question for me these days, because my favorite justice for a long time has left the court. And that's David Souter. David Souter was my favorite justice because he was so weird and just so odd and so great. Here's a guy who leads really an 18th century life. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have an answering machine on his phone. He doesn't like electric light. It's true. He, he moves his chair around his office over the course of the day to catch uh, the sun. Um, and that's how he likes to read. <clears throat> but um, the, the great thing about Souter is that even though you know, he, he leads this odd lifestyle, he has this wonderful perspective on what it means to be a Supreme Court justice. Because the Supreme Court is at once a very public institution, but also not known to the public, and especially the justices themselves are almost private figures, hardly ever recognized in public. For example, for reasons that remain obscure, to me anyway, David Souter and Stephen Breyer are frequently mistaken for each other. Now, if you know what they look like, they don't look anything alike, but it happens to both of them fairly often. And, you know, sometimes Justice Souter has a little fun with this. For example, one time, not too long ago, Justice Souter, as he often does, 
um, was uh, driving from Washington to his home in New Hampshire, and he stopped in a little restaurant in Massachusetts to get something to eat. And a couple came up to him, and the guy said, I know you, you're on the Supreme Court, right? And Souter said, yes. Yeah. You're Stephen Breyer, right? And Souter didn't want to embarrass the fellow in front of his wife, so he said, yes, I'm Stephen Breyer. <clears throat> then they chatted for a little while, but then there was a question that Souter wasn't ready for. The guy said, so, so Justice Breyer, what's the best thing about being on the Supreme Court? He thought for a minute and he said, I'd have to say it's the privilege of serving with David Souter. <laughs> now, how can you not love this guy, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but he's gone now and I need a new favorite justice and I am taking suggestions, so. Um, okay, now let, let's talk a little bit about the Supreme Court by the numbers. Um, there are six men and three women. First time in history there are three women on the Supreme Court. There are six Catholics and three Jews. There are no Protestants on the Supreme Court. Also, first time in history uh, for that. There are representatives of four New York City boroughs on the Supreme Court. Sonia Sotomayor is from the Bronx. Anton Scalia is from Queens. Ruth Ginsburg is from Brooklyn. And Elena Kagan is from Manhattan. Tragically, Staten Island is unrepresented on the Supreme Court. But uh, perhaps future appointments will address that, uh, that absence. Um, so anyway, those are, I hope, interesting facts about the Supreme Court. But I don't think they're an especially, they, those are especially important facts about the Supreme Court. Here's an important fact about the Supreme Court. There are five Republicans and four Democrats. Now I'm gonna speak somewhat longer, but now you know most of what you need to know about the Supreme Court. Um, it is sometimes hoped, it is sometimes believed, it is sometimes wished for that the Supreme Court is different profoundly from the political institutions, particularly the House of Representatives across First Street from the Supreme Court building. Um, it's hoped that the Supreme Court could just sort of not be political. It could just do law, not politics. Well, that was never possible, and it's certainly not possible now. And the fact that there are five Republicans and four Democrats and because, in controversial cases, the justices almost always vote along those lines, almost always, not always, um, that is, to me, the single most significant thing about the, the current Supreme Court. It is an evenly divided court, almost, with a slight but very important Republican majority. And to see why this moment in the history of the court is so important, I think it's important to look back at the history uh, of the Supreme Court, particularly the last time the court was not evenly divided, the last time the court was a unified ideological force. And that was the mid and late 1960s, when there were seven liberals on the Supreme Court, sort of the mid and late tenure of Chief Justice Earl Warren. And there were not just seven liberals on the Supreme Court, there was a real liberal agenda. Every Saturday morning, Earl Warren and his great deputy, William Brennan, they would meet and they'd say, like, what do we want to do? What are the cases we want to take? What are the law issues we want to push forward? And year after year, that's precisely what they did and they changed the law in so many areas. 1964, Justice Brennan's famous opinion in New York Times against Sullivan, which transformed um, the libel laws and gave the press important new protections. 1965, Justice William O. Douglas's uh, famous opinion in uh, Griswold versus Connecticut, the case that said states could no longer ban married couples from buying birth control, the case that established the constitutional right to privacy. 1966, um, Chief Justice Warren's opinion in Miranda versus Arizona, revolutionizing criminal procedure, and perhaps more importantly, changing television dramas forever. <clears throat> it's the one right everybody knows they have, right? You know, hey, I'm arrested, the right to remain silent, because that's what happens on TV, and it's even true. Um, 1967, perhaps the best named case in Supreme Court history. What case was that? Loving versus Virginia, Loving versus Virginia. What was the Loving case about? It was the case about marriage. 
It was the case that said states could no longer ban racial intermarriage. Think about that, 1967. There are people in this room who were alive in 1967. <laughs> am I right about that? I think I am. And, and it wasn't until 1967 that the court got around uh, to saying that those laws were unconstitutional. To put it another way, when Barack Obama's parents got married in Hawaii in 1960, their marriage was a crime in 20 states, and there were people in this country in prison for that crime in, in 1960, um, which gives you some idea how much the country has changed, and in, in an unambiguously good way, um, because, I mean, think about it, Th those laws uh, today are not only unconstitutional, they are literally uh, unthinkable. And um, that, those were some, and just some, of the signature decisions of, of the Warren Court. But you never know how Supreme Court vacancies are going to work. You never know for sure, anyway, because Richard Nixon became president and four justices left in quick succession. Jimmy Carter is the only president in American history to serve a full term and not have the opportunity to um, um, name anyone to the Supreme Court. There were just no vacancies while he was president. But Richard Nixon was only president for five and a half years. You'll recall he had to leave early. Um, but uh, he got four appointments. And, and who left? Well, a, um, Earl Warren left, Abe Fortas, Hugo Black, and John Harlan. They all left while Nixon was president. And who did Nixon name? Um, Chief Justice Warren Burger, Lewis Powell, William Rehnquist, and Harry Blackman. And as you think about that list, I think that tells you something about the Supreme Court, but it tells you something even more important about um, the uh, American politics broadly, and that is about the evolution of the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party of the 1970s was, uh, is and was unrecognizable from the Republican Party of today. It is a far more conservative institution, and that's reflected in the Supreme Court. Because a lot of people thought in the, um, in the 70s, when, when, when Nixon had all those appointments to the court, that the court would move dramatically to the right. But it didn't. And in fact, the 70s were, ne neither, were, were nearly as liberal as the 60s uh, at the Supreme Court. Think of the big decisions of that period. <clears throat> um, the uh, Nixon tapes case, they essentially forced Nixon out of office. The Pentagon Papers case. They ended the death penalty in the United States, declared every law on the books unconstitutional in 1972, though they did let it back in in 1976. And still, the most controversial decision of them all. Uh, 1973, Roe versus Wade, this, the case that said states could no longer ban abortion, that was a seven to two opinion. Um, and um, the only two dissenters in Roe v. Wade were William Rehnquist and Byron White, who was appointed by President Kennedy. So three of the four Nixon justices were in the majority in Roe v. Wade. Um, when President Ford nominated John Paul Stevens to the Supreme Court in 1975, he wasn't asked a single question during his confirmation hearings about abortion or the right to privacy, because this tells you where the Republican Party was in the mid-1970s. It was a moderate party. It was not a religiously oriented party. It was not a socially conservative party. And this brings me to today's news. Um, to me, the primary between Richard Murdoch and Richard Lugar is one of the most profound events in American politics of the year 2012. Um, Richard Lugar, as, as I'm sure I don't have to tell the people in this audience, first became famous because he was known as Richard, Richard Nixon's favorite mayor when he was mayor of Indianapolis, and then um, he was elected to the Senate, and he had a long career there um, where he was known as a very conservative senator. 
although in certain areas, particularly in international matters, because he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, which is known as not one of the more contentious uh, partisan committees, he, um, he worked with Democrats and, and he believed in international treaties and, and, and things like that. And um, a, as you all know, Richard Murdoch uh, defeated him in uh, a primary earlier this year and, you know, I, I, I don't pretend to know the precise implications of uh, his comments in the debate last night, but it is worth just f pausing to recognize that the whole focus of his comments, uh, rape, abortion, God, were um, a reflection of how much the Republican Party has changed. That kind of controversy, that subject for uh, public debate was something that simply did not exist uh, in the 1970s, and it is a reflection of how much the country has changed um, that Murdoch is now the standard bearer uh, of the party here in Indiana, and, and Luger, um, famous for being conservative, is out, out f through a vote of his own party because he's not uh, conservative, conservative enough. And those changes, um, those changes really began uh, in 1980 uh, with the election of Ronald Reagan. And, and Ronald Reagan brought with him to Washington when he became president in 1981, someone who is uh, not um, recognized, I think, sufficiently for the important figure that he is in recent American history, and that's Edwin Meese. Um, Edwin Meese, um, was an aide to Ronald Reagan in the White House. He was later Attorney General for a period of time. And Meese said, look, there has been a liberal agenda at the Supreme Court for decades. We need a conservative agenda at the Supreme Court and in the lower courts. And Meese made it his special project that Republicans would nominate young, for the most part, very conservative judges um, who would um, interpret the law according to their understanding uh, of the Constitution, which was very different um, from that of the liberals who had dominated the Supreme Court for so long. Um, what was that uh, agenda? Expand executive power and racial preferences intended to assist African Americans. Uh, lower the barriers between church and state. Speed up executions and above all, reverse Roe v. Wade and allow states once again to ban abortions. Um, another important part of what some people still call the Reagan Revolution was the arrival in Washington of a group of brilliant young conservative lawyers who wanted to work in the, Nixon in, the, in the Reagan administration. And who were two of the best and the brightest in that group? John Roberts and Samuel Alito. And when they were nominated to the Supreme Court, some of their papers from the, the period when they first came to Washington in the 1980s, they came out. And it tells you something. Um, Justice Samuel Alito in 1985, in a memo plotting litigation strategy in the Solicitor General's office, he wrote, what can be made of this opportunity to advance the goal of bringing about the eventual overruling of Roe v. Wade? Later that year, applying for a promotion, he wrote, I am particularly proud of my contributions to recent cases in which the government has argued in the Supreme Court that the Constitution does not protect the right to an abortion. Samuel Alito then, Samuel Alito now. But the, the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan was not the Republican Party of Richard Murdoch either. And you saw that in uh, Reagan's appointments to the Supreme Court, 1981. Uh, Potter Stewart unexpectedly announced his resignation from the court, and Reagan had made a promise in, 19, in the ca nine, campaign of 1980 that Jimmy, Jimmy Carter didn't even make. He said, if I have the chance, I am going to nominate the first woman to the Supreme Court. So he had a vacancy in short order, and he said to his people, look, find me a qualified woman. I'm going to keep my campaign promise. It was not a simple thing in those days, because there were not a lot of women, especially not a lot of Republican women, in the traditional pipelines for um, um, Supreme Court appointments, cir circuit court judges and the like. So Reagan's people went all the way to the intermediate appeals court in, in Arizona, not even the highest court in Arizona, and they, um, to find the extraordinary figure who was and is Sandra Day O'Connor. And even then, 
Sandra Day O'Connor was known as not a social conservative, not a religious conservative. She was a moderate conservative, and that was just fine uh, with Ronald Reagan. 1986, Warren Burger stepped down as Chief Justice. Reagan nominated William Rehnquist, from a, elevated him from Associate Justice to Chief Justice, and then um, um, filled that seat with Antonin Scalia. No question, conservative justice. Uh, the following year, a key turning point in the history of the Supreme Court, because that was the year that Lewis Powell resigned. Lewis Powell was the swing vote of his day. Justices, the justices don't like it when we in the news media use that phrase, um, the, uh, swing, the swing vote, because he thinks it makes the court look too political. Uh, but you know what? It's, it's been a useful phrase for, for decades at the Supreme Court. There has been one justice who controls the outcome. Excuse me, you want to close that door over there? Is that, is that okay? Um, the, uh, the one justice who controls the outcome of, of so many different um, cases. Um, and uh, so, so Powell's resignation was extremely important. Um, and so what did Ronald Reagan do? He nominated um, Robert Bork. Robert Bork to the seat that Lewis Powell vacated. And who, um, and something very important had happened between the confirmation of Scalia and Rehnquist in 1986 and the nomination of Bork in 1987. In the midterm elections of 1986, the Democrats had retaken control of the United States Senate. And so the chairman of the Judiciary Committee was no longer Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, but instead a young senator from Delaware named Joseph Biden. And Biden orchestrated hearings on uh, Robert Bork that really were a searching inquiry into what Bork stood for. Um, and, and Bork was very candid and very open about his views. He said that he did not believe there was a right to privacy in the Constitution. And he had written that there, the, the Civil Rights Act uh, was a monstrous thing, an invasion of people's personal privacy. And all of that uh, led the Senate to reject him, 58 to 42. And Howard Baker, who was White House Chief of Staff at the time, said to Ronald Reagan, look, we can't get someone that conservative through the Senate. And so Reagan nominated Anthony Kennedy to that seat in 1987, and he was, of course, confirmed. But again, it reflects where the Republican Party was during um, Ronald Reagan's uh, tenure as president. <clears throat> and that uh, the, 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 the Kennedy confirmation really set, set the tone for the, Reg the Rehnquist years on the Supreme Court. And um, I, th that's, when I started writing about the Supreme Court, uh, I was inspired uh, by a book that I'm sure is familiar to at least some of you here. Um, then that's The Brethren by Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong, which is really the first behind the scenes book about the Supreme Court. Um, published in 1979, a long time ago, and, and, and um, uh, the theme of that book was how all the justices, um, no matter how, whatever regard of their politics, couldn't stand Warren Burger. They thought he was a pompous jerk. And, and if you look at the history of the Supreme Court, those kind of contentious relations uh, were sort of, have been the, the rule more than the exception. Um, I don't know how many of you have had the misfortune to hear of a justice named James McReynolds, who served on the court from 1914 to 1941, who was such an appalling anti-Semite that he used to get up and leave the conference room whenever Justice Brandeis or Justice Cardozo would speak. In the 1950s, the court was known as nine scorpions in a bottle. Um, William O. Douglas in that time, a cantankerous liberal, um, served on the court for 36 years, longer than anyone in history. Um, he had a terrible car accident one summer in rural Washington State. He drove his car off a cliff. And the first question everybody asked back at the Supreme Court was, where was Felix Frankfurter at the time? Because they hated each other so much. Uh, they thought that Frankfurter might have tried to run him off the road. But as I started uh, reporting about the Supreme Court, I came to recognize that um, that had changed, that William Rehnquist 
was not unpopular. In fact, he was quite popular with all his colleagues uh, throughout his long, long tenure on the court. One reason he was so popular is that um, Rehnquist engineered a tremendous reduction in the court's workload. In the 80s, the court was deciding about 150 cases a year. By the time Reagan, uh, uh, Rehnquist died, they were deciding about 80 cases a year. Do the math. 80 cases divided by nine justices, divided by four law clerks apiece. I mean, it's a pretty cushy deal being on the Supreme Court. You know, it's, it's just they're not that, they're that, not that many cases to decide. In the 80s, uh, the workload had gotten so big that there was actually a proposal supported by Warren Burger to create a sort of super appeals court in between the circuit courts of appeals and the Supreme Court to sort of help out with the workload. And this idea went to the White House counsel for evaluation, and the White House counsel at the time was a guy named Fred Fielding, and he assigned a young lawyer on his staff named, named John Roberts to evaluate it. And this is what John Roberts wrote in a memo. While some of the tales of woe emanating from the court are enough to bring tears to the eyes, it is true that only Supreme Court justices and school children are expected to and do take the entire summer off. <laughs> the now Chief Justice does not talk this way anymore. Um, they only decided 64 cases last year and the entire summer off still looks awfully good from where he's sitting. And um, it is true also that uh, the court remains a pretty congenial place. The justices, by and large, get along with each other uh, pretty well. And to see that, you need only go watch a Supreme Court oral argument. And I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to do that. I'm serious about this. I really encourage you to do it. If you have the opportunity to go to Washington, Go on the Supreme Court website, find out if, there's, if, they're, if they're, the Supreme Court is going to be hearing arguments that day, and if you have the chance, go. It's really a fascinating thing to do. Um, it's very, it can be very entertaining. You get a really good sense uh, of the justices. It's not that big a courtroom. You, you can hear, you can see. It's, it's really a great uh, experience. And there is, of course, one very well-known fact about Supreme Court oral arguments. And that is that there are eight justices who are very engaged and very prepared and ask lots of hard questions, and Clarence Thomas never says anything. <laughs> February 22nd, 2006. That was the last time Justice Thomas asked a question. Six and a half years ago. You know, those of us who go to a lot of arguments, we sit there in the press section, you know, it's really, it's very small, you, you know, and you're just a few feet away from the justices. And you just can't help but sit there and think, will this be the day? Will this be the day that Justice Thomas breaks his streak? And it never is. It never is. And, and, and but see, this is the thing. This is why you have to go, because First of all, you might see the day when it's the streak breaks, but even more importantly, you'll see that Justice Thomas is not isolated or unpopular among his colleagues. They sit in seniority order. He sits between Kennedy and Breyer. They pass notes. They tell jokes. They laugh. I mean, it, it, Thomas is a it, valued member of the Supreme Court influential far beyond what most people think his influence is. I talk about this uh, in the oath. And, um, but just for his own bizarre reasons, he chooses never um, to ask any questions. Now, um, in thinking about the Rehnquist Court, I think it's useful to think of it in two parts, 1986 to 2000 and 2000 to 2005. Dividing point, um, in the history of the court, and in many respects a dividing point in the history of our country, is the court's decision in Bush v. Gore. 
Now, I admit uh, I'm a little obsessed uh, with Bush v. Gore. Um, the last book I wrote before the nine was called Too Close to Call. It was about the recount in Florida. And one of the things I tried to do when I was writing Too Close to Call was interview Al Gore, right? I mean, you can write a book on that subject. You'd certainly want to talk to Al Gore. Well, I tried everything. I wrote, I called, I begged. I, I, Gore wouldn't talk to me. He just didn't want to relive the experience. So uh, I wrote the book without his cooperation. Um, while I was working on The Nine, just by coincidence, I met Al Gore at a social occasion, and he had read Too Close to Call, and we were chatting, and, and, and I, I said to him, you know, Mr. Vice President, you're not going to believe this, but I'm writing another book that Bush v. Gore is at the center of. I said, I think I'm the biggest Bush v. Gore junkie in the world. And he said, you may be second. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I think you have to give him a nod on that, right? Because, you know, he had a bigger stake in the outcome um, th than I did. Um, you know, uh, Justice Scalia, um, as you probably know, is a very outspoken, funny, interesting, highly, highly intelligent man. And he does a lot of public speaking. He takes questions. He doesn't, you know, he's not afraid of anything. And, and when he gets questions, um, he often gets a kind of hostile question about, you know, what about Bush v. Gore? And he always says the same thing. Oh, get over it. Um, now, speaking just for myself, I am not over it, but um, lots of people, um, but um, the, uh, um, the, the, the Bush v. Gore had a peculiar and I think somewhat unexpected aftermath at the Supreme Court in, um, from 2000 to 2005. Um, as I believe you know, uh, Bush won that case and, and uh, became president, but, but the court after 2000 moved to the left. It became more liberal. Same nine justices, but the court got more liberal. Think about the decisions from that period. They ended the death penalty for the mentally retarded. They ended the death penalty for juvenile offenders. They decided Lawrence v. Texas, the case that said um, gay people could no longer be thrown in prison um, for having consensual sex. They saved affirmative action in the uh, University of Michigan Law School case, the case, um, famous Gretter case, decided, uh, an opinion by Justice O'Connor. And in case after case, they rejected the Bush administration's position on the treatment of the detainees uh, at Guantanamo. So all those cases, why, why did the court move to the left? Well, remember what I said about the Republican Party. Because during that period, from 2000 to 2005, during the presidency of George W. Bush, Justice O'Connor, the swing vote of her day, grew more and more alienated from the modern Republican Party. She <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you say. I'm just, just stating a fact. She became more and more alienated from the Republican Party. Why? She didn't like John Ashcroft. She didn't like the way the war in Iraq was being conducted. She didn't like the, 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 um, the war on terror. And above all, Justice O'Connor was alienated by uh, something that doesn't get a lot of attention today, but I think will loom rather large in the history of the last decade, and that's the Terry Schiavo case. The Terry Schiavo case had a big impact on Justice O'Connor, in part because it had to do with the issue of judicial independence, which she cares deeply about. But even more importantly, um, the case um, was about um, who makes medical decisions for a critically ill family member. And it was at precisely that time, 2003, 2004, 2005, that Justice O'Connor's beloved husband, John, was slipping into the grip of Alzheimer's disease. So this issue of whether the government could step into a family decision about this sort of thing was not just an abstract issue to her. And, and she had um, a visceral uh, reaction to it. Uh, and in fact, um, it was John's illness that led Justice O'Connor to step down from the court uh, in 2005. Um, and um, jo George W. Bush named justices to the court who reflected the modern Republican Party, not the Nixon Republican Party, not the Reagan Republican Party, but the modern Republican Party. And jo John Roberts and Samuel Alito reflect that, the, that the, the 
Republican Party is more conservative, and you see that in the Supreme Court's decisions since then. Um, they um, created a new understanding of the Second Amendment, uh, recognizing an individual right to keep and bear arms, um, which changed the law dramatically and struck down gun control in the District of Columbia and in Chicago. They struck down the school integration plans in Seattle uh, and Louisville, and of course in the signature decision uh, of the Roberts Court, 5 to 4, 2010, the justices struck down the McCain-Feingold law and in the Citizens United case and really revolutionized uh, how our campaigns here are, are, are paid for and, and what the limits or lack of limits are on campaign contributions, both for corporations and for individuals. And it was during this period that Stephen Breyer, who has no hysteric said of his new colleagues, it is not often in law that so few have quickly undone so much. And this was quickly followed by three departures from the Supreme Court. Sandra Day O'Connor, David Souter, and John Paul Stevens. Three more different individuals you will never encounter. Sandra Day O'Connor, this tall, outgoing, charismatic former politician from Arizona. David Souter, the shy, reclusive bachelor from New Hampshire. John Paul Stevens, the wily antitrust lawyer from Chicago. Different parts of the country, different personalities, but one very important thing in common. They were all three Republicans. They were Republican appointees to the Supreme Court and they left the Supreme Court completely alienated from the modern Republican Party. In a conversation I recount in the oath, Justice O'Connor is standing with Justice Souter um, shortly after Justice O'Connor um, announced her resignation in, from the court and she says to him, why, why is our party destroying the country? I thought we were the party of limited government. I thought we were the party that didn't get involved in foreign uh, wars, and Barry Goldwater, she said, never gave a damn who you slept with. Um, and Souter and Stevens were so alienated from the modern Republican Party that when a Democrat became president, they both promptly left the court and gave their precious seats to Democrats. To, to a Democrat, Barack Obama, who filled those seats with Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, whose judicial philosophies are much more in line with Souter and Stevens than they would be with the Republican president. And these justices, I assure you, they pick with great care which president gets to appoint their successors. And Souter and Stevens picked Obama because that's where they thought the Repub their Republican Party belonged, in the Democratic Party. Um, all of which led to the climax of the last Supreme Court term, and certainly the climax of my book, um, The Oath, uh, which is the health care case. The Obamacare case, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sebelius, argued in March over three days and decided on June 28th. Now, one of the perils of working at CNN, as I do, is um, they keep the tapes of the stuff you say on TV. Um, so much as I would like to say I predicted the outcome and knew how this would resolve itself all along, I was completely wrong uh, about uh, how this case was going to come out because during the oral argument, as you recall, the core issue in the case was, does the individual mandate, the requirement that individuals buy health insurance, does that violate the Commerce Clause of Article 1? Does that um, exceed Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. And, and uh, given the questions of the four conservatives who asked questions, Roberts, Kennedy, Scalia, and, and Alito, and given the you know, views we know that Justice Thomas, though silent, has, um, we, I, I thought, well, the individual mandate is gone. They're going to overturn the law. Well, on June 28th, and I have to say, one of the privileges of being a journalist is to see history unfold 
uh, before your eyes. And because the Supreme Court, um, I think foolishly, uh, doesn't allow cameras in the courtroom, only a handful of us were there on, at 10 o'clock in the morning on June 28th. And when the nine of them um, came out from behind the red curtains, you know, there, there were no exit polls. There, there were no um, public opinion polls. No one knew for sure what was going to happen. And Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts began reading his opinion in the case. And he said, as, as, as it appeared likely, that Congress did exceed its powers under the Commerce Clause by passing um, the individual mandate. But, he continued, the government offered an alternative justification for the individual mandate. He said that, that the government had said, and the government had said this in a part of the argument that got very little attention in the oral argument, that the individual mandate was a use of Congress's taxing power, not its Commerce Clause power. And he said, to the great surprise of many, including me, that the law was constitutional under the taxing power. Why? Why did Roberts, for the first and only time in his six years as Chief Justice, side with the four liberals in a, in a five to four case? Well. Um, let me give you a few reasons. First of all, I think you have to take his face value, what he said. Well, I think the, uh, um, he thinks it's a valid exercise of the taxing power. Well, I think it's a little more complicated than that, though, too. Because Roberts knew that he was the embodiment, the, the, his was, he is personally the embodiment of the Supreme Court. He is the representative of the Supreme Court. He is the custodian of the court's public reputation. And he knew that the Obamacare case was fundamentally the third in a trilogy. Bush v. Gore, 2010, 2000. Citizens United, 2010. And in each of those two cases, five to four, the court had issued dramatically partisan opinions, pro-Republican, anti-Democrat. And it looked at the oral argument that that pattern would recur for a third time. And if that pattern had recurred for the third time, and if the five Republicans had damaged, perhaps fatally, the central accomplishment of a Democratic president, it would have damaged the Supreme Court's reputation. And in the campaign that's unfolding now, the Supreme Court would have been a major issue rather than the rather extremely subsidiary issue um, that it has become uh, during this campaign. And Roberts does not like the court to be the focus of intense political controversy. So he was looking for a way out. Plus, finally, if you look at the conservative agenda at the Supreme Court, the one that's been in existence since Meese, uh, Edwin Meese and the uh, Reagan administration, end racial preferences, speed up executions, reverse Roe versus Wade. The Obamacare case was not part of that agenda. In fact, the individual mandate was a Republican idea. It came from the Heritage Foundation. It, wa it, it was supported by Newt Gingrich. As I believe you know, a former Massachusetts governor named Mitt Romney, he basically came up with the whole idea and, and, and brought it to success in Massachusetts. That was not part of the Republican agenda. The argument that it was unconstitutional, this idea had been around for 20 years, and no one even suggested it was unconstitutional until just a few months before it was passed um, under President Obama. It was a highly political case, a political argument, and Roberts had the good sense to know that the court should not be a part of it. But I assure you, John Roberts, last June 28th, did not suddenly discover his inner moderate. He remains a strong, outspoken conservative, and we will see that year after year, decade after decade, um, as Roberts continues his tenure on the Supreme Court, and he will be politically more powerful than ever, less susceptible to criticism as a partisan because of his vote uh, in the Obamacare case. And I look forward to watching it all unfold with you. And now I'd like to take some questions from you.
Thank you very much. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful auditorium this is. Okay, you want to go to the microphones and have at it? I don't see the second one. Uh, okay, there's one, there's the other. I see someone walking. No, someone's just leaving. Uh, uh, okay, there's someone who doesn't appear to be leaving, yes. I think he's looking at me. Okay, my question is, uh, you, you knocked the Republican Party for how far right they went. How come you didn't mention how far the left, the Democrats, went from the Kennedy time? From the, from the what time? Kennedy's. Well, presidency. I mean, you know, I, I think it's very tempting to see sort of an equivalence there that, you know, the Democrats have moved, the Republicans have moved to the right, the Democrats have moved far to the left. I don't think there is an equivalence there. I think the Republican Party has moved much farther than the Democrat has. For example, look at, look at the health care plan. I mean, you know, if, if, if Barack Obama were the, you know, old-time lefty that he um, is, is supposed to be, he would have proposed a single-payer plan. You know, socialized medicine, that, that has been the dream of the left. You know, a system like England, a system like France, like, like Canada. But instead, he basically steals this Republican idea from, from the Heritage Foundation, from Mitt Romney, and I think that's indicative of, of what kind of president uh, Obama has been. I, you know, I, I, it's tempting to see, look, look at the Democratic Supreme Court appointments. Um, Breyer, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. They're not as liberal as Thurgood Marshall or, or William Brennan. I mean, they're, they, the Democratic Party of today is not as liberal as the Republican Party is conservative, in my opinion, for what's yeah, worth. I, I don't know why you and I disagree so much on that. The, the, last, two, the last two Supreme Court justices are so far left that it's just unreal. And then you don't even think they're left. I, and well, I can't see why you don't see that. Well. We'll just have to disagree, I guess. <laughs> and, there, and, oh, I can't ask another. I would just like to express my disappointment that the justices of the Supreme Court are legal experts who are there to decide according to the law different cases, and yet it sounds more like it's, it's more political than legal. And. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Well, you know, I, I've heard, I hear comments like that frequently, and your comment prompts me to defend the court, uh, because I think, and, and this is with, without regard to, and, and this includes both the liberals and the conservatives on the court, because um, when you look at the kind of issues that the Supreme Court gets, does the Constitution protect a woman's right to an abortion? May a university use race in admissions? Just to pick two prominent examples. Those questions cannot be answered as purely legal matters. What matters is the ideology you bring to um, answering those questions. Look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. Two you know, they see the world very differently in terms of the Constitution. But both are smart, both are honorable, both are ethical, both are doing the job as best they can. They just have different ideologies. And, and that has always been true of the Supreme Court, that the ideology of the justice will always have a big impact on how a case comes out. And I just accept that as, as reality rather than crit criticize them for it. But I, but I certainly understand uh, your frustration. Yes. I wanted to ask about the campaign finance uh, ruling. Um, oh, we're real close to Ohio, and we're seeing you know, just ad after ad after ad. And I'm wondering, is there anything coming up through the courts that's going to you know, be, possibly have another outcome with the Supreme Court, uh, another? These nine justices, the question is, you know, what about Citizens United? Are they going to cut back on it? No. 
These nine justices are deeply committed to the idea that corporations are people and that money is speech. And, and you know, the, the court gets a lot of criticism for this corporations are people argument, and I actually think the court is on pretty solid ground there. Remember, you know, I work for CNN. We waive the First Amendment all the time. You know, we have a right to access to public proceedings. You know, we, we are using the First Amendment. CNN is a corporation. Corporations are the beneficiaries of the First Amendment. I don't, I don't think that's a problem. I, what I have more of a problem with is the idea that money is speech. The idea that giving money to a candidate is the same thing as going out on a street corner and giving a speech or holding up a sign. You know, speech, you know, and, and, and justice, and, and as Justice Stevens says, said in his very powerful dissenting opinion in, in um, Citizens United, he said, you know, money, money is not speech, money is property. And we regulate property in this country. And that is something that, uh, but that view does not command a majority on the Supreme Court. And if you look at the subsequent opinions that the justices have given in the campaign finance area, 2011, 2012, they, they are expanding Citizens United. They are not narrowing it. So they, they are in the process of deregulating American politics. And it's, it's, it's happening sooner rather than later. A, a quick follow-up. Sure. Um, the uh, McCain-Feingold, they found something unconstitutional in that law? What, what was it? Well, the, 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 specifically what they held was um, that uh, there's a provision in McCain-Feingold that said uh, money could not be spent uh, if, if the money came from corporations uh, 60 days before a general election or 30 days before a primary. And they said corporations could not be regulated in that way, and that's what, and that's what they struck down. Thank yes. you. Um, I recently saw one of our, our beloved women uh, who was retired, a Supreme Court, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, on the Parade magazine. And I, I followed her all along, and I especially had to laugh when her uh, father uh, like pulled some little tricks on her husband when he was going to propose to her. But what I was interested in, she said a statement which was, uh, I'm not finished yet. And, and what do you think about that? Well, I mean, Justice O'Connor, she retired um, in, 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 in 2005 at the age of 75. And you know, she was and still is a very vigorous person. And, and she has devoted her career, her retirement to two things. Uh, one is civics education, uh, having students learn about how uh, the government works. And, and she's got a, a piece of software that, that she's involved with. And, and, but, but more interestingly, I think, one, her, the other cause has been um, trying to get states to appoint their judges by appointment rather than by election. She, has fi she, she believes judicial elections are a corrupting process, and, and having partisan elections for judgeships is, uh, is something that demeans the judiciary, that leads to really bad campaign finance situations, and um, that's, that's the cause. And she's been very outspoken, and she travels all the time, and she speaks. I, I think she's, someone here has told me she's been to Fort Wayne three times. Um, she's a, she's, and she remains, you know, she's on the road all the time. Thank you, Mr. Tobin. I really appreciate that. Thank Shalom. you. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> Can you uh, comment on, uh, you mentioned the desire to be apolitical from the, uh, from the bench, but can you comment on the uh, State of the Union and the uh, nonverbal uh, Right, or just, just to refresh your recollection, um, the, the Citizens United decision was uh, handed down uh, January, uh, I believe, 14th, 2010. And six days later was the State of the Union. And uh, President Obama, uh, this is, not to do too much advertising here, this is described in dramatic detail in the oath, which is for sale outside. Um, the, uh, um, Obama, said um, he really attacked the Supreme Court's decision 
while the justices were sitting there during his State of the Union address, and Justice Alito um, mouthed the words, not true. Now, if I could just sort of pause parenthetically there for a second. You know, uh, Alito and, and Obama have a considerable history. Um, o o Obama voted against Alito's confirmation when, when Obama was in the Senate. On a week before the inauguration, ju uh, Vice President-elect Biden and President-elect Obama paid a courtesy call on the Supreme Court and uh, Justice Alito was the only justice who chose not to attend. Um, the first law that Barack Obama signed as president was the Lilly Ledbetter Act, um, which overturned a decision of the Supreme Court, by, which had been written by Samuel Alito. So there, is, there was real tension between the two of them. Now, there was some criticism of Obama for attacking the court, and there was some criticism of Alito for sort of mouthing the, these words back. I thought both of them behaved entirely appropriately because I think it was a great moment for public education because it was a moment that said, look what's going on here. There is real conflict between this court and this president. They are both outspoken, they are both entitled to their opinions, and it was a, just a wonderful window to what was going on and what is still going on at the Supreme Court. So my thought was and is more power to them. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for speaking tonight. It's been a wonderful talk. Thank and uh, you. you might like to know that Sandra Day O'Connor stood right there giving an omnibus lecture a few years ago. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, you're in good hands with us. Uh, I, it's, uh, I, I don't think she spoke precisely the same way about the court that I did, but I, I, I... She talked about incremental change and the yeah, importance of incremental I, I, but, change. But I s certainly admire her a great deal, as I think you can tell. Um, my question has to do with what you mentioned about the Bork hearings. And um, uh, ever since then, anyone that strives to be on the Supreme Court, I'm sure, are very conscious about anything they publish or say in opinions and, and in articles, uh, because everything comes under quite a bit of scrutiny now. Um, how do you think the litmus test that there are now for Supreme Court justices, how do you think that has affected especially the lower courts and kind of the, uh, um, the dialogue of formation of judicial law within the United States? Well, hmm, I, you know, I'm not sure I see the implications for the lower courts. Uh, I mean, the most obvious um, implication, at least to me, of the Bork hearings has been two things. One nominees with rather thin and mysterious paper trails ha have been preferred. You know, j they have not been as outspoken either on the left or as the right um, as, as Bork was. And, and, and so, you know, you have people like um, John Roberts and Elena Kagan who worked in the White House under Reagan and Clinton who had a lot of important people got to know their views but they hadn't written a lot about their views. So they were somewhat stealth, stealth candidates. Also, just in terms of how the senator, how the nominees um, conduct themselves during the, the hearings, they stonewall. They don't, ask, they don't answer questions the way Bork did. And uh, Arlen Specter, um, the late, just died, the senator from Pennsylvania, you like to say, and I thought it was exactly right, you know, every Supreme Court nominee, nominee will say the minimum amount in order to be confirmed, and that's a pretty minimum amount. Um, you know, I have um, a lot of admiration for Sonia Sotomayor, but, you know, when she was asked her judicial philosophy during her um, confirmation hearings, this is what she said, my judicial philosophy is to follow the law. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. You know, I, I mean, it just, could we get more insipid and banal than that? I mean, you know, th th there's, this stuff matters. There are differences. You know, Ruth Ginsburg follows the law. Antonin Scalia follows the law. But they have judicial philosophies that send them in different directions. And that's what these hearings should be about. But, you know, these, the, these nominees want to be confirmed. They don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, educational. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here tonight. This is great. Uh, I wanted to ask a simple question. As an adult, you sometimes re 
respond to issues in religion or social values based on things you received in your youth, maybe in your teen years. As you look at these justices, do you often reflect on what they did as a child that got the opinion, that brought that opinion out of them later on? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I, you know, I guess the answer is no. Um, I, 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 I think their, their childhoods, you know, are, are not necessarily the determinative factor. I mean, what, what, you know, if, if I may, in the best political tradition, um, answer a different question than the one you asked, uh, <laughs> is, um, you know, what about the religion? You know, six Catholics, three Jews, what, what's the significance of that? And, and, I, and that has something to do, I suppose, with their childhood. You know what? I don't think it's very significant. You know, if, if you look at Supreme Court appointments, they're a wonderful window into um, where the country is politically. You know, in the early part, you know, the 19th century, the country was divided regionally. Um, so it was very important to have a justice from Massachusetts and a justice from the West and justices from the South because that's how you know, the country was divided up. Once we had this big wave of immigration later in the 19th century, um, there started the first there was a Catholic seat on the court. Then in the early 20th century, there was a Jewish seat uh, on the court. Um, Civil rights movement, 1960s, Thurgood Marshall, first African-American. 1981, after the feminist movement of the 1970s, first woman, Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, Hispanics, growing importance in this country, Sonia Sotomayor in 2009. John Roberts, Sonia Sotomayor, Samuel Alito, they were appointed because of their ideology, not because of their religion. The fact that they are Catholic is incidental. Sonia Sotomayor is liberal. John Roberts is conservative. Both are Catholic. William Brennan, most liberal justice in the history of the court, very serious Catholic. I, you know, our religious divisions are not nearly as significant as they used to be. Our ideological divisions are significant. That's why justices get appointed to the Supreme Court, because of their ideology, not because of their uh, religion. At least that's what I think. Yes. What are the chances that a non-judge uh, be appointed or someone with extremely limited uh, judicial experience in the future? You know, this is, this is a really great, important question. And, and if in 1954, uh, the court that decided Brown v. Board of Education, not one of the justices had ever been a full-time judge before. Earl Warren was governor of California. Um, Hugo Black was a senator, Rob, um, William Douglas was head of the SEC, Felix Frankfurter was a law professor. There was an incredible diversity of backgrounds. Um, when Alito replaced O'Connor in 2010, nine, oh no, six, I apologize, 2006, um, all nine justices were former federal appeals court judges. Now, Elena Kagan broke the streak, but she was dean of Harvard Law School, which is sort of like judge-like background. I mean, what the court really needs, I think, what the court needs is a former politician, someone who understands. You know, Justice O'Connor added so much to the court because she had run for office. You know, it's one thing to talk about Citizens United, about abstractions like money is speech and corporations are people. What about having someone in that court, in that you know, conference room that says, um, let me tell you what it's like to raise money. Let me tell you what campaign contributors expect. And, and, and I think that's a terrible absence uh, on the court. Uh, I do think um, that there is a possibility for uh, both Romney and uh, Obama to, to name non-judges uh, to the court. Um, you know, if John McCain had won, in 2008, he certainly would have appointed, I think, Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina. I think Lindsey Graham is still a possibility uh, if, if Mitt Romney uh, wins. Um, I think if Obama wins, Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts, is a possibility. Uh, Kamala Harris, the um, attorney general of um, 
uh, uh, California is a possibility. And Janet Napolitano, the Secretary of Homeland Security, former governor of Arizona, I think she's a possibility. So, you know, Obama and Clinton in particular um, did talk about um, non-politicians. Uh, Clinton basically begged Mario Cuomo to take a seat. This is a story I tell in the nine. Um, and, and so there have been efforts in that regard, but I, I hope Democrat or Republican they succeed because the court needs that diversity. No chance on Hillary Clinton, you don't think? No chance on Hillary Clinton. Uh, no chance on Hillary Clinton. Um, <laughs> I mean, for one reason in particular, you know, Hillary Clinton's already in her mid-60s. I mean, age really matters in these appointments. Um, I predicted, with my famous accuracy for predictions, <laughs> that in 2008 that Hillary Clinton would win the presidency and then appoint Barack Obama to the Supreme Court, which is not a crazy, which not have been a crazy idea. I mean, he is obviously knowledgeable about that, but sort of didn't work out. Thank you. And with that, I think that's it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Mr. Tubin. That was just great. And, and thanks for the lively dialogue with the audience.